Hi there friends, this is Rob Smith with Integral Life and welcome to our first Integral Live webinar. Thanks for joining me as we uh, get this new feature kicked off for our members. I'm uh, glad to be able to host this uh, about my uh, essay that I wrote uh, at the beginning of the year and in the middle of last summer, uh, The Great Divide and The Great Release and how I uh, look at the rise of Trump uh, and the end of U.S. hegemony. So there's a couple hundred people online. Thank you for joining us and um, let's get started. So I've been thinking about how I would tell this story because um, it's, a, it's a tricky one. I guess I would start by saying what uh, brought me to it. When I, when I started writing The Great Release, I was very interested in the deep underlying uh, structural dynamics that explain the rise of populism in the Western world and the developed world. I wanted to understand uh, the rise of Trump in particular in the US and how he became so popular. I was also looking for not only a deep view, but a, sort of a wide angle view, something that looked at a long period of history and made sense of that. Um, in this uh, webinar, I won't spend a lot of time on the 800 year arc of capitalism that I looked at in part two of the essay. Uh, but suffice to say, there, there are many credible people who believe that capital grows in successive waves of higher complexity and higher integration over time. And if we look back over 800 years, we can see the emergence of dominant economic empires, the latest of which, of course, is the United States, which really became the focus of my attention. And once I looked at it through that lens, actually, it became very obvious why the phenomenon of Trump happened. My central thesis is that since 1945 and the formation of what some experts have called the world state, which is the group of organizations and efforts that the United States helped sponsor after World War II, uh, which really refashioned the global landscape and it reorganized the global order at that time. Everything from the general agreement on trade and tariffs to the United Nations, to Bretton Woods and the new currency agreements, the new security agreements that were put in place. This entire superstructure of a global order arises with the US basically at its lead. And of course the Soviet Union is not too far behind and, and with it arises the bipolar world. You know, two major Cold War states competing for global dominance after the war. What I try to show in the essay is that since the end of the war, we've lived through a larger cycle of growing and then stagnating American dominance. This cycle, which we'll look at here in a moment, follows a particular set of predictable dynamics. And if we look at the cycle in detail, it really explains the rise of populism today, in my view. Uh, the punchline is the United States has become very irresilient. And I use this concept a lot to describe what's happening at home and, and in other places. So let's spend a moment on that. Uh, recall from systems theory the notion that systems arise throughout the known universe in all kinds of ways. Resilience is a term that signifies the ability of a system to respond to changes in its environment. So when a system becomes irresilient, fundamentally it's, it's less able to change. It's less able to adapt to changing conditions as well as it once did. Now, the reason systems become irresilient and stagnant is because as they win, as a system develops a winning strategy, they actually become less likely to change. Winning systems become less likely to want to screw with their winning strategies, obviously. Uh, to the winner goes the spoils. And so the more it wins, the more it doubles down on, on known strategies. Unfortunately, this has a perverse effect. It makes the overall system of which is a part uh, less apt to change, less flexible, less capable of responding to a changing environment. Now this happened as we approached the 1970s in the US led uh, system. And it's really happened since the 1970s in a different way. And we're living through a period right now where we're wrestling with many things in our overall social, cultural, economic, and life systems that are not able to adapt as they once did. Now I show some evidence of that uh, in the essay and I'll, and I'll get into some of that in the slides in a moment. 
One of the things that I've also really come around to thinking is an interesting set of what I would call polarities and trade-offs between the dynamics of the cultural dominance and the economic dominance of two different phases inside the adaptive cycle of U.S. hegemony uh, since 1945. I think it's pretty fascinating that you end up after the war with fundamentally sort of a conservative cultural landscape with relatively homogenous cultural values in the United States. But you also end up with an economic dominance that's driven by center leftist economics. Uh, the New Deal was a theory coming out of Keynesian economics in which the government was seen to have an important role to play in the stabilization of markets and the smoothing of the business cycle. Roosevelt was swayed by the importance of Keynes's view uh, as he navigated the Great Depression, and it inf really informed his thinking when he established uh, the sort of technocratic underpinnings of the world state. The idea that the United Nations and other organizations populated by knowledgeable, globalist-oriented uh, experts could support a form of world governance that would transcend the nation-state for the first time, at least in some degree. So let me share my screen. I'll begin to take you through some of this here. There we are. What I'm going to take you through here is something that I got into uh, in the original paper but I've articulated it and sort of described it a little bit differently in uh, this version. This is a picture of the adaptive cycle, and I think it also describes uh, holonic dynamics, the way in which one level of a holarchy or a holon uh, begins to differentiate from its current way of operating and then transcends to another higher and more complex level of the holarchy, another holarchical level. Uh, of course, it could be a regression uh, there could be a breakdown and, and reorganization that could be regressive for a while. Now, the adaptive cycle gets into some of what I'm thinking is happening in terms of the two main players in the overall world state holarchy. The multinational capital holon and the multicultural culture holon. Just the twin MCHs, for lack of a, an uglier term. You know, these two holons will have a starring role. They sort of have a starring role in the dynamics of a lot of things going on uh, as we see the evolution of the United States from the post-war period toward 2017. So let's go all the way back to what happens in the first phase of the adaptive uh, cycle. Um, and of course, keep in mind that this first phase of the adaptive cycle, it's coming out of a prior reorganization. So this can be thought of... Um, Actually, let me show you, let's see, let me show you this one here. Okay, this is the right one. You can see that going back 700 years, um, this, this same cycle of release, reorganization, emergence and rapid growth, conservation as we level out here, and then release again and reorganization goes back, you know, 100 years. So in each case, we see a successive up leveling of the complexity of the global operating system of economic and political organization. Each one of the major up levelings is sort of preceded by a major release here, 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 and here, uh, and a reorganization. And world systems analysts would argue that each reorganization is driven primarily by um, the drive to allow global capital to continue to grow. Capital meaning the amount of money or, or money like substances that are available overall. And that this has been going on, as I said, really in the since the, the dawn of the modern capital era. At each level of successive increase uh, in complexity, here we've got on the left-hand side, complexity, differentiation, increasing global scope, 
uh, geographic scope, an increasing number of people brought under the prevailing global system. So we go from the city-state um, of the early 15th century of Genoese hegemony to a reorganization as we approach the 17th century, early 17th century, under Dutch hegemony of the province state through to the nation state uh, with the rise of British hegemony in the British Empire, and then a reorganization after the war uh, in the 20th and 21st century of the world state. Um, and as, of course, you know, as we approach this tail end here, that's obviously of, of great concern to where we are today. So this meta cycle is centuries long and contains four macro cycles of successive up leveling uh, in the overall level of complexity and differentiation driven by a prevailing hegemon of the time. And each, uh, each, brought, each, each, each cycle brought into power a, a series of wars that end up fostering the shift of the balance of, of global power of the time. Of course, the interesting question that we get to the end here is, as well is what does the next reorganization looks like? What, what does the release that we might go through look like? What's the next uh, reorganization look like? So now let's just go back to the um, American cycle uh, since the end of 19, or since 1945, since the end of the war, which is really where the reorganization occurs and now the rapid growth cycle um, kicks in. And, and recall that the entire point of a release, the entire point of a release and a reorganization from a systems evolutionary point of view is to allow the system to grow more rapidly to continue innovating and to shake off the stagnation that it encounters late in its previous cycle. So the prior release and reorganization produces a new rapid growth phase here, um, a time where resources are flowing between participants in the system quite rapidly. There's a lot of innovation. There's a lot of what might be thought of it as exploitation of ecological niches. It's a time where, where resilience is actually quite high. There's there's a lot of flow of resources. There's a lot of agility and adaptivity. There's a lot of um, there's a lot of uh, opportunity seeking, uh, and the actually the the ability of the entire system to respond to change is, is still very high. So think about the forest glade, which I mentioned in the paper. The forest glade uh, after a big fire. You know, the, the big fire comes through and wipes out a lot of the underbrush, and right after that big fire, five or ten years after that. Of course, there's rapid growth where all of the players in that ecosystem, so plants, animals, microbes, etc., in the ecosystem, they move quickly to populate two new little niches in the ecosystem that are now available because of the because of the release in, in the form of the fire and the reorganization that happens uh, under the fire. And that's really what the rapid growth cycle is about. Um, it's, it corresponds to the United States' golden age of capitalism as, as America really re, you know, helped to rebuild the industrial uh, infrastructure and economy of countries all around the world. Um, it's one of the fastest period, growing periods of American growth. Uh, we basically double our GDP. We get out of debt from, from the war. Um, and there's, there's a sort of dominance, as I said before, there's sort of a dominance on the economic left and, 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 the, and the cultural right, you might say. That's why I put that up here. Uh, and it's not an accident, you know, and, and we'll come back to this, but it's not an accident that this is the golden era that, that Trump remembers from his childhood. This is the age he was raised in. This is the period he harkens back to. When he says, make America great again, this is, this is really what he's thinking about in terms of his own psychology. And again, there's a there's a Keynesian uh, New Dealism that undergirds this entire era. By about the 1960s, call it mid 60s, of course, we know what happens. Uh, I'll, I'll quickly mention a discussion I had with Integral Life's David uh, Reardon recently. He said something kind of interesting. He said it was the stability of his parents uh, during this period of him growing up that gave you know him and and, and his peers in the 60s the it really allowed him or allowed that generation to burst out culturally and challenge the accepted values of the time. So he's really talking about the golden age of capitalism providing the social stability for the counterculture of the 1960s to arise. 
And I think what's really fascinating here is how the stability or instability of one phase gives rise to the innovation revolution or pushing back against the stability uh, in the next phase. And that's really what we see as we enter into the 1960s with the cultural explosion. The protest riots of 1968 occur, uh, the equal rights movement, the cultural discord. And, and so by the end of the 60s, we're already seeing real signs of a lack of dyna dynamism in, in the U.S.'s ability to adapt to change. Um, there are several theorists and, and social scientists who have documented the way in which the, the economic and, and conservative powers that be, be specifically set out to try and change the uh, economic doctrine from a leftist doctrine to a right a right right leaning doctrine, basically about this time. And and keep in mind what's happening as we move from the rapid growth phase here to the conservation phase um, is. You know, this is now 1970. The United States has populated the world with its world state philosophy. You've got the CIA out there. You've got the military everywhere. We've got a nuclear standoff with the Soviet Union. We've got you know economic and security agreements all over the place. This really is is the heyday um, of two big dominant superpowers. And really, the point is that the rapid growth phase of the ecosystem population out in the world is now sort of settled down. From a systems point of view, it's moving into a conservation phase. It's, it's about conserving your gains now at this point. Um, remember I talked about that a little ago. The whole point of the conservation phase is to take gains that you've made, strategies you've put, you've put in place, and exploit them. At the same time this is happening, uh, from the point of view of the overall sort of geopolitical system, we also have the powers that be within the United States um, who are in a way winning globally, but they're still subject to this leftist New Dealism. And, you know, and they're fighting back. They see the opening. You know, the cultural revolution that's occurring in the 60s threatens them. And they really would like to embrace a much more unabashed free marketism. And actually they do. They succeed. They succeed in great measure, as we'll see uh, here in a moment. Um, this really becomes the rise of the soil in which uh, neoliberalism uh, comes to be grown. So as we move into the conservation phase, we shift from, we shift from a dominance, uh, economic dominance on the left and a cultural dominance on the right to, to its exact opposite. So the 1970s was a transition decade between those. And if, you know, if John Maynard Keynes was the intellectual hero of the, of the New Dealism, that undergird uh, the rapid growth phase. Really, it's Frederick von Hayek who is the hero of the neoliberalism that undergirds the conservation phase. This idea that markets and free markets should be the arbiter of most aspects of life in, a, in an attempt to preserve individual freedom and resist the power of an overbearing state. Now, it's important that we mention that this is also the period where precisely this phase shift occurs uh, between the left and right in their dominance of, of culture and, and economics. Whereas this period here was um, uh, culturally conservative and economically liberal, conservation phase starting in the 1970s sees the rising dominance of a left-leaning culture and a right-leaning economy. See, following the protest and cultural movements uh, of the 1960s, late 60s, the economic, military, and political power monopolies sort of attack Keynesian New Dealism as the prevailing economic contract. And they replace it with sort of the totalizing logic of Hayek's free markets. Uh, all the while, that you know, postmodernism and, and identity politics from the far left begin to increasingly erode the stable moral calculus of the conservative middle class. So this, this is actually quite ironic. It's as the moral calculus erodes that it's as, you know, this moral calculus erodes from the left that it provides free reign for the global economic dominance by capital while also guaranteeing that a value back, values backlash is, is going to come by those culturally dispossessed conservatives uh, who you know, are eventually not going to be happy about the, the, the rising ascendance of this postmodern leftist culture. 
And so this really sets off the reversal between previously dominant economic and cultural modes, wherein cultural liberalism and economic conservatism now come to dominate the, the next 40 years, really between 1968 and, and 2008, 1970 to 2008. In any case, by the end of the 70s, uh, we start to see the cultural left in the dominant position and the economic right in the, in, coming into the dominant position, especially with the election of Reagan in the U.S. and, and Margaret Thatcher in, in Britain. Uh, this is the beginning of what is known as financialization, among other things, you know, where the government lets loose on deregulating anything they can. This includes the financing of college, for example. It includes retirement plan deregulation that gave rise to the 401k industry and the current retirement industry so on and so forth. So it's too deep to get into in just a little time we have today, but if you look at it just piece after piece, the explosion of what moral philosopher Michael Sandel calls a market-based society really starts, really starts here. It starts in this conservation phase following uh, 1970. And we end up with, you know, over the next three and a half decades with a simultaneous set of things happening. One is that we end up, as we end up as a market-based society, we also end up with a postmodern, dominant, leftist way of understanding culture and exchanging, exchanging meaning and values as a tribe. And this combination really sets us up for the great recession that we get into in, in 2008, starting here. Um, you know, it's not controversial to say that the great recession occurred uh, because of several things. One was the unfettered deregulation of capital in its hunt for profits, such as the repeal of Glass-Steagall in 1999, uh, which allowed the commercial banks and investment banks to start operating as one entity again. And by the way, it was during the Great Depression that they took that right away when Glass-Steagall was originally erected, but by 1999 they reversed it again. So you see it right there. I mean, it allowed all kinds of questionable and dubious behavior on part of the banks. It allowed them to securitize the middle class housing industry in a really speculative way, you know, really speculative way, for example. Um, and, you know, what's interesting is it's not just a problem of the neoliberal capital agenda. That's also the postmodern cultural agenda that gives rise to this. You know, the government was being guided by a culture driven by social equality at any cost. You know, everybody deserves a house. And when combined with the capital class uh, and their sense that there's profit to be made in financing those houses, you know, financing houses regardless of credit quality, there's, there's kind of a strange bedfellow effect and perfect marriage to allow for capital to just rip through society and finance everything. Um, th this was in a way the perfect marriage between what I called the, the multinational capital hole on and the multicultural culture hole on. And you might think we've learned something uh, today, as of today, but you know we we really haven't. We're starting. We're staring at a trillion dollar vehicle debt problem as we speak. Of course, we see the high asset values that we're encountering again in the housing market and many other areas. So this is the story of the conservation phase. You know, it's the story of the United States becoming less agile, more irresilient because it's becoming more economically monopolistic and financialized due to the interests of the capital class. Um, and more culturally undiscerning and strident due to the interests of the cultural class. One of the examples I used in the essay was that of Kodak. I mean, Kodak should have continued to be a very successful company uh, with the rise of digital photography. But it was precisely their winning strategies up to that time that prevented them from innovating. So they got stuck in not innovating and they went bankrupt um, a few years ago after 124 years of being in business. So, you know, large large entities with a lot of power are not immune to having really bad things happen to them when they when the power or strategies or innovation slows down and they become stagnant. And I think there's a very strong argument to be made that that's happening in our in our political, economic, social and cultural power across the country. So that brings us to the current moment. So after 1980, we see the rise of massive wage inequality. By 1989, the U.S. has, has you know, actually won the Cold War to some degree. And that has interesting follow-on effects because it allows for more unrestrained foreign policy. Uh, and, you know, 10 years later, we have, or actually within a few years, we have, uh, you know, s significant wars in the Middle East, 
some of which become massive foreign policy disasters, uh, you know, not only by measure of what they did to the Middle East, but by what they did to, you know, our treasury and our people. And all the while, our economic and political power in the country is becoming, becoming more concentrated. Our resource flows have been stagnating and our, ex our external missteps are getting costlier. So it's a classic description of your resilience brought on by a dominant ecosystem uh, player. And for those of you who have seen the paper, this is some of the stuff that I point out in the paper, and I'll, I'll take you through a few of those charts um, now. And these are just, you know, signs of your resilience. You know, business deaths now outpace new business creation. Older companies outpacing young companies as share of total firms. As you look at this, think about, just think about concentration of power. Think concentration of power, concentration of resources, agility, innovation, all these things. Companies accumulating cash since the 1970s. Um, cash is a percent of total assets. Large business monopoly has increased. Federal regula regulations has grown unabated. Education stagnant while real spending has gone up. So it's not just an economic picture, it's a social picture, it's a cultural picture, it's psychological. Highest level of total global debt since World War II. Degradation in social trust, you know, in the sense that we don't share the same values or we can't trust our neighbor. Political polarization at historical highs, going back to 1879. Um, the healthcare systems become less resilient, in part because the, the feedbacks to end users in the form of prices has been, has been gradually destroyed since 1960. So people don't have any feedback on their own behavior relative to pricing and use of medical care. So medical care costs have skyrocketed, where, whereas behavior in the population uh, has done all the wrong things in terms of the population health outcomes, obesity, diabetes, and all that. And of course, obesity skyrocketed as a result. Uh, you know, so just in, in slide after slide after slide, we can see evidence of your resilience. We can see evidence of the consolidation of power. We can see the evidence of, of feedbacks getting eliminated in places where we needed them. System feedbacks to the players, uh, concentration of, of resources, uh, declining innovation, and, and the like. And what I'm really pointing to is that, you know, this is this is evidence of, of sort of a late conservation phase. It's, it's, it's classically late conservation phase sort of data where Late into a system's life cycle, it gets it gets stagnant. Uh, it becomes irresilient. So all these are, are all these things are signs of, of of irresilience, and and more and more power being consolidated. As power and resources consolidate, they become less free to, to move, and that's a real problem from the standpoint of being ready to adapt to a 21st century that's throwing curveballs at us every day. And you know what we'll get to here momentarily is how this really describes the rise of, of populism. So by the first phase, by the first decade of the new millennium, I, I, we've shifted really into the, the beginning of the release phase. I mark it at 2008, although it's somewhat arbitrary, but it's a pretty good date because of the, the Great Recession. You know, releases occur when systems can no longer adapt to changes in their environment and, and reality intervenes, reality happens. Something small or big comes along and just breaks the system. Power, res power, resources, and stagnant monopolies get broken up. And notice that in the release phase of the last 10 years, it's not so much the center right or center left that has been dominant. It's, it's been really only the extremist right and the extremist left. We've got a wide ranging breakdown of societal patterns and power flows, economic and social stagnation, personal feelings of alienation, um, get depression rates and suicide, uh, mental health issues, we have cultural fragmentation, civil discord, and what Emile Durkheim called anomie, the sense of having uh, not having shared values in our tribe. 
uh, we have a loss of U.S. global leadership respect, and and now the election of populists, which I'm arguing actually was quite predictable. So let me talk about the election of populists in particular, because I, I, I think it speaks directly to what I talked about in The Great Divide. We clearly have this tribalist versus globalist dynamic that's going on, and I think that's actually at the center of, of the whole um, Trump moment. And I think the story is pretty fascinating. So the conservative tribalists have long been unhappy about the incre increasing dominance of the left in culture uh, for the last three or four decades. They've been unhappy about the increasing dominance of the cultural holon, the, the multicultural culture holon. But they also perceive that they're losing ground economically just in the last few decades. And, and this is critical. Because the argument I made in The Great Divide is that the tribalists on the right were, were willing to overlook the ascendance of the cultural left, the multiculturalism, the ethnic cosmopolitanism, and postmodern values, as long as their economic gains were still intact. But here's what's interesting. It's with the rise of the global capital class and the, capital, the multinational capital hold on after 1970 the middle class in the United States also starts losing economically. Financialization, neoliberalism, and globalization really have butchered the economic stability of the American middle class. So conservative tribalists feel like they've been losing both economically and culturally. What's also important is that during this conservation phase, um, this conservation phase here since the 1970s, both the capital hold on and the culture hold on begin to supersede the identity, structure, and purpose of the U.S. as a nation state. And it's loyalty to the nation state that's most native to the tribalist mind. You know, and instead, they're being asked to submit to this cosmopolitan, transnational holon, this multicultural, interdependent world state. But it's simply no longer worth it for them to do that. And I'd argue that actually what we're seeing on both the left and the right is in a way a mirror reaction of each other. So I'm going to slow down and try to articulate this clearly as we move into, into the release period and in the last decade. So the tribalists on the left and the right see both of these two big transnational holons, one representing capital, the other representing culture, putting the national holon, the United States, into service. And they do this through either repression, which means using the power of government to quash lower order rules, norms, and, and the like, or sub-optimization, in which a smaller sub-national faction hijacks and perverts the broader interests of the national government. This causes a fervent backlash on both sides of the political aisle, you know, in their attempt to sort of protect their self-identity and their values by battling against the worst excesses of the opposing hull on. The right supports Donald Trump to fiercely combat the culture hull on, and the left supports Bernie Sanders to fiercely combat the capital hull on. So what you had in Trump and Sanders was a mirror reaction in equal but opposite ways. The tribalist left were responding against the capital hull on in an attempt to preserve and protect their cultural values while fighting the worst excesses of the capital class. Yet you have the tribalist mind on both sides of the political spectrum pushing against the opposite re reaction. And so on the right, we get Donald Trump, who's railing against the excesses of the cultural hold on, is transcending the national heritage, while also trying to preserve the tax cuts and other anti-government policies that will almost entirely benefit capital holders and not the middle class. Though many of the you know, the tribalists on the right don't understand that they might be voting against their own economic best interests. In any case, both sides are railing against the capital and culture that have transcended the national interest since the 1970s. Uh, and neither are attending sufficiently to the needs of the nation uh, before so doing. So you have this interesting set of dynamics where the world state, the whole on that is the world state on the left in the cultural sense, on the right in the economic sense, have, have both transcended the nation state. And as I mentioned in the Great Divide, this is a cataclysmic error on the part of globalists throughout the political spectrum. You can't force societal evolution to transcend and exclude. You must attend to lower order needs first and use that as the foundation from which to build a leading edge of values and policies. 
So I'm not going to get into it tonight, but if you wanted to paint a strategy of where we have to go as a country in order to preserve our values, uh, we have to do a better job to include what has either been repressed or dissociated as those moves occurred in both spheres. All right, I'll show you this graphic, and, and hopefully I don't get too far um, astray here. This is not in the paper, but it sort of illustrates the point. What I've done here is just shown a quick four quadrant holarchy of evolution of productive life, moving from the foraging age to the horticultural age, uh, mercantile, I'm sorry, agrarian age, mercantile, industrial, and information age. Uh, in information age, uh, in industrial age, well, let's, let's go back to mercantile. Mercantile age, so call it, you know, 13th, 12th, 13th, 14th centuries. Industrial age, um, you know, 17th, 18th, uh, 19th centuries, uh, early 20th century, information age really kicking off, arguably with the invention of the transistor um, in 1947, although I guess we could go back to the, to the radio. Um, and then the transformation age, which I've always marked as 2008, not because of the Great Recession in this case, actually 2007, um, but because of the rise of 4G data networks and the, and the smartphone, which I think just dramatically changed the nature of, of human life in terms of our, our values and the, and the way in which we're going to conduct our affairs going forward. And, you know, and that may or may not be accurate, so we'll see. So that's in the uh, upper right. And in the upper left, what we're looking at, of course, is the, the stage of consciousness or, or meaning making or, or ego development. And we know this hierarchy pretty well. But we can see what, what different modes of economic production might correspondingly support in terms of the stage of, of meaning making. In the lower left, we have the organizing social value. So that, that, that value that is so critical as the primary organizing social value for, for society, for a society that is at, at the leading edge of wherever else you are in, on this chart. Um, and of course, you know, the organizing social value um, is important because a lot of what's happening as we've moved out of the industrial age where we were optimizing for value to the postmodern age where now we're optimizing for equality, or at least that's the way, you know, we might think about it. And the postmodern age since 1970 in the cultural sphere really is equality at all costs. Now, this may be a sort of a pathological version of it. I think, I think Ken Wilber does a, a really nice job of pointing out how equality at all cost has become um, sort of a militant and, and frankly self-contradictory philosophical problem for them. And in the lower right, we get the social organization that also corresponds to it. Moving from city state to province state, nation state, world state, and well, what's next down here? Um, you know, it's a big question. Whatever's next, it, it can't exclude what's come before. If you go to a trans state of some form, uh, it 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 cannot abolish the nation state. It's it's it, you know, for example, so for example, the reaction of the right to a rejection of the rule of law of the nation to enforce its own border for example, is a, is a totally legitimate problem. Uh, and it's a, it's a problem, um, it's a valid policy criticism of the left, and it's, it's a problem philosophically, and it's a problem pragmatically in terms of the way the holarchy has to evolve. And that's, of course, one of many things they're responding to, rightly in my view, and it, it needs to inform the immigration debate. Now, of course, the right's often not responding very effectively or skillfully, but if you look at these dynamics, you, you can see where the battle lines are being drawn as various groups within these holons from their various levels of, of uh, economic production or values or uh, levels of meaning making are drawing the battle lines for the emergence of various holons, other holons at the leading edge. You know, there's right now a battle about the emergence of, or the submission of the nation state to the world state as Trump wants to take us back to sort of a pre-World War One, pre-World War One footing of ethnic and economic nationalism that was prior to the world state. 
of the information age. I mean, fundamentally, he's he's arguing for an industrial age or or you know mercantilism or even uh, protectionism. Um, and you know, so so these things play out in in a in a way that's to some degree somewhat predictable once we have the uh, right view. And we can expect the, the social hierarchy uh, from various ways. We can expect the social hierarchy to throw a legitimate fit um, in, in from these, these different angles. So we could do the same thing if we looked at what's happened with economics as well. Uh, as capital moved to something that's 24 by 7, you know, I can move a New Zealand dollar to a Japanese yen, to a Bitcoin, to a Cayman account in the blink of an eye. And there's part of the middle class, there's part of the middle class that's felt left out by the fact that capital's mobile. You know, it's territorially mobile. It's trans-statal almost instantly. It's transnational instantly. And they're basically saying we don't want capital to not be in service to the national hold on. Um, that's a big deal, and, and at least... Uh, another good part of why Bernie Sanders and, and Trump were both very popular amongst that group of folks. One last thing I'd say about Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump is, is that it was only the left who nominated a candidate, I mean, in the final, you know, the general election, who, who nominated a candidate who didn't pick a fight with either of the big multinational, multicultural holons. Clinton did not pick and she won't pick a fight with the cultural hold on, but she also didn't pick a fight with the capital hold on. And amongst many other reasons why she lost, and obviously we know many of those, at a meta level, that's argu arguably the biggest one. Uh, you know, that's a big factor at the core of it. Beyond the trust, beyond the misexecution, beyond the messaging, it's fundamentally that they didn't try to resolve either of the two biggest dynamics and holonic imbalances in the global world system today. And Strangely, in some ways, Trump picked a fight with both. Uh, he picked a fight with both, and he won because of it. Now, as a side note, he picked a fight with both because coming from these lower order uh, levels of, of meaning and these lower order values, and they're previous, they're in all of us, so this is not, this is not a pejorative statement I'm making, but they're more fundamental, you know, freedom. Uh, value in the sense of creating economic value in jobs and protecting the value of the jobs inside the nation state, you know, order and freedom and the rule of law and might and being strong. Um, it was natural for, for Trump or, or anyone from that tribalist mindset to see how both culture and capital of the world state had transcended their interests and they didn't like it. And this is a problem the left has. The left has this problem because it's stuck in its globalist mindset of a world state. It does not know how to appropriately sort of um, reintegrate what it has left behind in its in its prior um, in its prior values down here, and that's a real problem because it's always it's always making a, a polarized trade off between them, and it doesn't need to. Do. It needs to harmonize them. So both parties, I mean, both parties are still badly struggling to figure this out and, and navigate their contradictions uh, around this. Um, just yesterday, I picked up the New York Times and I saw another headline that proves this point. You know, both parties stuck in battles trying to defend their extremes. In the case of the left, they're fighting about how to bring online a natural, genuine economic agenda that can counter the multinational capital interests and become a little bit more of economic populists while also trying to tone down their identity politics and tone down the stridency in their in their identity politics and what's funny is the exact opposite is happening on the right they're trying to figure out how do they preserve some of what they're trying to do for their economic gains um, but not look like racists and, and, you know, turn off and fight in an explicit way the multicultural values that much of the country now has. And so both, both parties are struggling what to do with this because they've not overcome their internal contradictions and the grip of their extremist bases. Which really brings us to the part of the paper and probably where, where most interesting and unknown, unknown, excuse me, unknown work still exists, which is coming back to this, you know, this, this momentous leap. 
this momentous leap we're going through. Uh, you know, we're in the middle of the release. It's been going for some time, but you know, I think we have some pretty ugly days ahead. And yet, we're maturing every day. We're maturing to our contradictions. We're maturing to these paradigms that aren't working for so many levels of society that are moving us toward a significant reorganization. Uh, a reorganization that, that, you know, as our year-end event, What Now?, has termed, we're calling this momentous leap in honor of Claire Graves' use of the term. So let me go through that for a few minutes and then and then I'll see if I could take some questions uh, on, on the webinar and I'll wrap it up. So what are some of the things that the mo momentous leap I think has to do? What are some of the things the reorganization has to do? Um, let's see here. Stop sharing my screen. Bear with me. Okay, so what are, what are some of the things that the momentous leap I think has to do? Um, some of the imbalances that, that we've addressed so far have to get addressed, first of all. We're going to have to become more attuned to the kind of system dynamics that I'm talking about, to these kind of whole system logics. We're going to have to become attuned to polarities and the way in which these cycles, the, these cycles of history, these cycles of power, they're evolutionary. So there's no one right answer. Um, the answers and the policies are, are contextual based on where we are in the cycle. If you're in the growth phase of a given part, uh, of your strategy, then you have a different kind of approach than if you're in the conservation phase. We need leaders who understand that. We need leaders who understand polarities and tensions and leaders who can advocate for integrative policies that make room for all of uh, society's values and people and lets them all feel included in the progress and viability of society at all of its levels, not just individual or local or tribal or state or national, but also global. And that takes some work. It takes some work and some wisdom and, and, and great leadership. The extreme right economic philosophies of neoliberalism in a, in a market-based society is going to have is going to be something we're going to wrestle with. Uh, and I think we'll see major upheavals to it in the coming ten or fifteen years, because math simply won't work as more and more of the wealth is in fewer and fewer hands. Um, on the left, the extreme cultural philosophies, the identity-based culture, it can't sustain itself. It's it's ontologically false. And it's philosophically very easy to pick apart. So our cultural philosophies are going to have to mature to restore the possibility for genuine hierarchical and discernment-centered moral critiques to occur. Uh, we also know there's problematic concentrations of power, financial, political, and cultural power for each. So we're going to need to see the restoration of resilience and, and growth hierarchies at the personal, community, state, national, and international levels. The tension between dogmatic partisanship and the harmonization of, of polarities is a big one. Um, the logic of simple static dogmatism uh, will have to grow into more process-oriented evolutionary logic. Uh, these will grow first among our leading-edge classes, our leaders, our pundits, our commentators, our book writers. And the good news is I'm seeing it every day. Our, our uh, you know, I'm seeing it every day there's more and more a notion of a need for this radical centrism. Uh, that's something I'm stealing from Corey, uh, but I, I saw it in New York Times this morning with David Brooks in his editorial. I think this notion of a radical centrism is going to become the sort of new intellectual ground which our reorganization begins to take place. A couple of, a couple of other tensions I'll mention, and then I'll start to close. So um, individual liberty and property uh, versus collective responsibilities in the commons, that's just a big deal. It's always been a big deal going back to Plato, but every generation has to learn it anew. Every generation has to renegotiate it, particularly when they haven't spilled blood. They have to renegotiate it at the cost, at the cost of their own ignorance of history. That's just a fact of what we're living through right now. People don't know their history well enough. And then finally, autonomy and decentralized innovation, which is which is fantastic versus and in part with submission and service to higher purposes, uh, the nation, creed, that kind of thing. I mean, all of us need some parts entrepreneurial anarchist as well as, you know, a really good neighbor and fierce patriotic citizen. And getting that balance, I think, is, is what the country is, is, is re-maturing to. 
And by the way, you know, we're not alone. We see it in Britain. We see it in Austria. We saw it in France, although they probably learned their lesson from our misadventure with Trump. I'm talking to my friends in Latin America. They're seeing it down there, though their populists tend to come from the left. So this is happening all around the, the world, particularly the clients of the world state. Now, whether China arises to become the next hegemon or not, which I made a case for the possibility in part three of the Great Release, I will say I actually don't think that's going to happen ultimately. I think that between the diversity of the United States, the, reverse, the robustness of our rule of law, and frankly how battle-tested our evolutionary holarchy is in the form of our constitutional republic, I think ultimately these things will all end up being more resilient, more adaptable, and re more reliable uh, morally and otherwise to the other nation states who are going to want to continue to follow in our development path. So let me say this one other way, which I think is important. I think we're probably one of the first nations, large, powerful uh, nations, to wrestle with the really hard problems of the green stage of evolution, this postmodern stage of evolution, in a significant way, with contradictions of power from both the capital and the cultural side. And I think because we're the first to wrestle with it, at a huge scale, as long as we can navigate it successfully for the next two or three decades, I suspect we'll also be eventually the most useful leader to all countries who are following in our wake of development, even though I do expect them to peel off for the next several years um, and, and sort of shirk our, our lack of a legitimate claim to moral leadership, genuinely. Okay, with that, let me uh, let me take a question, um, and we will move into a little bit of a Q and A with, uh, with the time we have left. And some of these I'll take by text, and some of these I'll I'll do by by audio. I'm gonna go for it. Well, first of all, Rob, I just uh, thought your paper was terrific, and this is really um, a lot of new integral thinking to me, and I'm really. I'm loving it. And I got to say that the thing that hit me uh, between the eyes tonight in what you talked about was, um, you know, I always talk about <clears throat> from an integral perspective, we want to be including the best of the previous stages in terms of, you know, our own self-development and, and, and consciousness. But what I really haven't thought about is that we also want to include the, the previous structures so that we have the world state, we have the nation states, we have the city states, and we have even down to the tribes. And that we want all of those to be online and healthy. So uh, that's new to me. And, and I just wanted to, uh, you know, say bravo on that one. I got to uh, chew on that for a while. Hey, Jeff, thanks for saying so. I think one of the concepts I think is really fertile for us to think about is this notion of repression, which is how a higher part of the Holonic stack sort of oppresses the needs of a lower part um, as one form. Or sub-optimization, which is when a lower layer of the holonic stack, the holarchy sort of goes up and grabs hold and cannibalizes the higher in service to its own needs. So an example of that, of course, is, is any of the business lobbies in the U.S. that take charge of the government and then regulate the whole country in service to their needs. When we see the coal industry leveraging the Trump administration to set up the argument for the government subsidizing coal, this is a classic form of, of sub-optimization. Ironically, it's also a huge spit in the eye to free market principles. You know, coal's losing out to clean energy and natural gas for market-based reasons, and it's probably already game over. And yet this narrow set of capital and labor interests in the industry wants to put the entire country's regulatory and financial resources at its disposal to benefit themselves. Now, this is the kind of thing that should drive everyone absolutely mad, but it, it largely gets partisanized through tribal politics and the fact that, you know, human psychology doesn't easily encourage people seeing their own hypocrisy in ways that are out of integrity. So I think that from a political point of view, this notion of repression, top-down repression, or bottom-up suboptimization are always distorting processes in our bo body politic. Anytime those happen, you can expect some group of people to be legitimately harmed. In a way, it's allowing for the development of societal shadow. We're really pissing some people off and dissociating from what are probably their legitimate needs. 
In this case, the coal industry is harming the nation's genuine needs while simultaneously standing in the way of their own growth and skills and, and adaptation to reality. So they're also harming themselves in the long run. And I think we need leaders who can point these things out and say, Let, look, let's, let's keep these regulations, needs, or policies appropriate to the level in which they're happening so this repression or sub-optimization is mitigated. Let's keep the hierarchy clean and appropriate. You know, they wouldn't use the, this language, of course, but this, the message would still land at the level of concern, driving real fears and distortions to begin with. And, of course, that's, that's an ideal. Uh, they're not going to be able to do that entirely, but at least they could be aware of it. All right, looks like somebody else has got their hand up. Uh, Jonathan, I think you're on as a panelist. So uh, I'm not getting any feedback for volume, so I'm just going to hope that you can hear me and answer the question. Um, my question is related to something about, um, like, a lonic world related to this economy where something like the cryptocurrency market would penetrate the world market like right now i can use my resources to buy a bmw with cryptocurrency and the resources i have for my job i can use to buy a house and other economic things so is there something like all things integrating to, together in a certain way that's sort of the genesis of my question is all of all of these states Okay, let me restate that because the sound wasn't good. I think Jonathan, Jonathan's question was, um, with some of the cryptocurrencies now that things are happening with the blockchain and Bitcoin or what have you, um, you know, wh where does that go? So, you know, it's because I mentioned it in part three when I was just imagining what possible acute situations might be that take the U.S. out of its power position. And... You have to recognize where its power comes from. Um, it's obviously multifold, but as I mentioned, it does come very concretely from things like the Navy. We guarantee the world's waterways, and by doing so, we underpin the security of the global economy. That's one. It's going to be very hard to displace the U.S. arbitrarily without that fact also being largely mitigated. The other thing that's a huge source of our power is our capital market. Our capital market is still the largest free-flowing capital market in the world. The flow of capital, the ability to have arguably a, 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 you know, a well-functioning court system and a rule of law that protects people's money from around the world means that we have a very liquid bond market. And it's why the dollar is the reserve currency. Again, the relationship between the Navy and our security agreements, the role that we have militarily and our capital market, it's no accident that these co-arose after the war. Uh, it's no accident then that we're able to take advantage of, of that with lower borrowing, borrowing rates as we act as a reserve currency. So the question about the blockchain, you know, Bitcoin and these trans-statal currencies is not an idle one. It's actually really important because it goes to the heart of the role of the American dollar and other ways we may remain a leading power and support the emergence or not of a better 21st century governance system. One of the reasons why Bitcoin is getting the energy it is because it has is because it has that sort of disruptive potential. You know, if it's not handled properly, the first thing that's going to happen is once it really gets legs, the governments are going to regulate it. So a lot of what everybody's expecting, then of course they're already looking at it. The banks are all already over it. You know, all over it. You can now transact online with Bitcoin, etc. So what's really going to play out for the next five to eight years is what do those regulations look like and, and who do they serve? Do they, do they, uh, are they really serving sort of an intelligent and wise, you might say, integrative move that has the possibility of allowing you know, uh, more interesting uh, global evolutionary drives? Or do they really become suboptimized to particular capital interests or you know, factional interests? And if so, you know, will they exacerbate the very problem we've got, or will or will they be disruptive in an integrative and powerful way, um, or servants of the existing order? So we'll see. You know, I'm a big fan of Ethereum as a blockchain application platform. It could serve to, I think, reorganize certain aspects of our productive life at a teal level of of transstatal and transcorporate complexity. Okay, um, let's see, next question.
Okay, uh, by that I assume you mean, Brent, do I expect a continuation of the hacking, electioneering, and voter manipulation we've seen, and do I expect it to get worse? Yes, no question about it. Now, now that we've, be, we've been shown to be vulnerable, it's only going to be encourage those players to do more of it. Uh, the technology is only getting better. The big data is only getting smarter um, or, or more pronounced. The machine learning and AI is going to get more optimized in terms of the psychology. Uh, but what I like about what I like about everything that's happening in a way is there's a counter reaction. I, I pointed out the dialectical responses to Trump in the paper, and um, I, I've got it shown as a holarchy. Um, and maybe I'll, I'll I'll share my screen in a moment. Actually, let me do that now. Okay, so in the dialectical responses to Trump, one of the ways I showed that, that Amber or the, the sort of tribal mind will, will respond is that populist administrations will try to redefine the nature of truth and the credence of propaganda. And, you know, by the way, I'm not tooting my own horn here, but I, I would give a testimony to the power of an integrative mindset and thinking holarchically. Because if you can understand what the forces are doing from the different holarchical holar levels, you can, you can predict a lot of what's, what's going to happen in terms of the flow. And right now we're batting like 900 on, on these predictions. So that's just a, a sort of plug and a testimony for the power of an integral approach and integral, integral analysis. But what's going to happen uh, is these kind of tribalist mind propaganda mechanisms will continue to be used. But as we predict up here, coming from um, some of the information age and, and profit-oriented uh, need structures, Silicon Valley uh, begins inquiring more deeply into the purpose and effects of the technology they're creating. And... Social networks are creating counterbalancing algorithms against fake news and to reduce their role in, in rampant epistemic closure, basically the closing of minds and echo chambers, social echo chambers. So all of these things are happening all up and down the, the spectrum. And, I, and I, I think it's just, you know, it's, uh, I, I, I like the fact that just in the last couple of months, for example, Twitter, Facebook, and a few others have you know, they finally thrown the towel and said, we're not going to resist anymore. We're just going to start banning folks and we're going to start responding quite aggressively. Obviously, that brings up problems of its own. But I guess my point is that anytime there's an attack on a very transparent world that we live in today, the good news is there's going to be a synthesis that begins to occur pretty fast. And I think that's something that's really easy to overlook in some of the pessimism or naysaying is how fast the world can respond to things it's noticing now. And things are really transparent, which is great. So even though the Great Release period is going to be very volatile, um, with that much transparency and real-time information, the learning is going to happen right before our eyes. You know, and it's, it's really fascinating. It's like, you know, four-quadrant evolution is, is occurring before our very eyes on both sides of the aisle and, and on all levels of the, of the spectrum. Okay, uh, I'm reading another question here. Brad McCormick asks, how does the rise of technology factor in here, particularly as we are entering late stage capitalism? We've got winner take all dynamics and do we need things like universal basic income? And do we end up with more socialist ideas? I, you know, I think ultimately the answer is yes. I, I think the value shift that has already occurred amongst the upcoming generation and the data on values is pretty clear that the economic and cultural right of today is in for a world of hurt in the next few decades. The extreme versions of their worldview largely dies with them, I think. Uh, so I think that game's already played out, and that's just a matter of time for the millennials to actually vote in the process of political leadership to play itself out to adapt to that. Uh, simultaneous with that, though, is, is that real income and real economic abundance that, that will occur as technology improves our lives. Probably not in the next five years, but at some point maybe in our lifetimes we see or might see free energy. And the moment we see genuinely free energy, you know, it's a total game changer. It changes everything. Uh, nature of manufacturing, the nature of costs all up and down every aspect of human life. So 
there's a lot of that's going to happen in the next several decades uh, that take us to a natural endpoint uh, of some sort, a natural transition point. You know, we can't say when, uh, but at some point in the 21st century, perhaps work will become more or less optional. Uh, you know, in that kind of society, what you're not going to have is nine people not working and everybody else being enslaved to their interests. If that were to happen, those nine people are going to end up murdered and the reorganization will occur in such a way that it spreads the resources that, that works for everybody. So evolution of our political process, our values and, and all that will follow along naturally with the abundance that comes, uh, that comes with it. Now, economist Thomas Piketty wonders if we don't end up this century with another class-based aristocracy, uh, which we've had for 2,000 years and really was only absent in the 20th century. So he sees all the trends pointing this way for this century to get back onto sort of a class-based aristocracy. And history is on his side for that view. Um, but I think the nature of power has changed too uh, in important ways. And so I guess I'm being positive. I think we end up in a, in a more positive version of, of a future where social democracy and a, and a robust um, safety net are, are far more likely. Whether or not how bumpy it is we get there and the pace of technology and the innovation that drives it remains to be seen. Uh, but I'm actually encouraged, you know, that universal basic income is being run as an experiment in various places. It's these sorts of small scale, small scale experiments that I think will be helpful to sort out what works and doesn't if we're to scale them up. Incidentally, it's a little known fact that, you know, you, although UBI has a very long history, you know, many conservatives have supported the idea in the last many decades, you know, including Richard Nixon and Milton Friedman and others. Um, something I don't think Republicans advertise too much today. Uh, in fact, Sarah Palin's state of Alaska, you might argue, is the, is the site of one of the largest UBI experiments there is with their, you know, with their oil rebate, oil revenue rebate. Okay, next question. Dexter asks, how do I f see us finally getting to planetary governance? Uh, I'm not smart enough to answer that. I, I think that some of the dynamics we see though over the last 700 years, you see what some of the precipitating conditions are that give rise to those sorts of reorganizations that can, de that can then do that. Um, as I said in my opening comments, I believe the 21st century challenge fundamentally is one of governance as we get to a post-dash world. So post-energy, post-work, post-money, post-singularity, post-AI, all these things are coming. And, and maybe most importantly of all, post-predictability. So it's, it's in fact that rate of change and all the disruption it brings that will force, it will just force naturally a reorganization to emerge that's intelligent enough to handle it. You know, it may not. We could regress back to the dark ages or, you know, in a, in a nuclear holocaust or a bioterror thing of some form or whatever. But, you know, I've got to bracket out some of the really bad stuff because if that happens, then, you know, that's a, that's a different picture. But, you know, assuming we continue to evolve in a healthy way, all of those life conditions are going to force us to move to a more planetary level of governance. In my, in my TED Talk in 2012, I, I kind of refer to this. I mean, the, the world is interconnected for the first time, all of us, in real time. That will, by force, create and compel new forms of governance, uh, new innovations that, that, that drive all of this in the making. So what it's going to look like, I don't know, but I bet you it's going to have a lot of the characteristics that, that we've seen here in, in this last you know hour. It's going to re rebalance a lot of the holarchy. It's going to have more discernment in it, more decentralized innovation. It may have things like, um, you know, biomimicry capitalism at the local level, for example. It may have uh, re regulatory structures to support that. Uh, it may include decentralized autonomous organizations on the blockchain. It may have alternative local currencies combined with trans-state, you know, global cryptocurrencies, um, all of which is just stuff today. I mean, you know, who knows what will be possible in 10 years. It probably has networked forms of work and wealth, you know, co-working, co-sharing, and cooperative asset and profit accounting. Uh, I, th I think that's just a big deal. Uh, the Fortune 500 is not organized properly for the 21st century, and they know it, I think. 
So the nature of capital and how it's measured and how it functions is changing, you know, before our very eyes. And it probably has a, a more full, full, full four quadrant um, form of, of scorecarding and, and measuring progress across every level of the societal hierarchy. You know, it's not just about you know money and wealth in the lower right. It's it's about resilience. Um, it's about balance. It's about uh, well-being. It's about uh, it's about cultural cohesion. You know, measuring these things and, and paying attention to them in a way that we can legitimately say, perhaps for the first time, we have a global scorecard that applies to everything from the individual all the way up to planetary wide, every level of the hierarchy in all four quadrants in each domain. And here's what's important based on the best science in those domains. We can say what's important and we can measure and manage to it as, as well as we can. Had we done that over the last 30 years, we wouldn't be in the situation we are today. Full stop especially if we combine it with, with good leadership. So it's probably not a satisfying answer, but as I said, I'm not, I'm not totally smart enough to answer, answer that altogether. Uh, I can take one more final question if there are any, and if there aren't, then we can adjourn. Let's see. Okay, there's Dennis. Yeah, a lot of what uh, you were saying was reminding me of some work that uh, – uh, Sri Aurobindo wrote with the human cycle almost 100 years ago in terms of social evolution. And the, 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 the problem with imagining, you know, moving from family to clan to tribe uh, to city state, nation state, the problem with imagining what's beyond the nation state without a corresponding shift in one's own consciousness or without an evolution of consciousness is that we continue to operate from a place of separation for instance, of, a, of, of the individual, but we project that into a global stage. So instead of moving into an, an actual uh, state of commonwealth or federation of nations, we move into a, a hegemonic state in which one nation, for instance, like, uh, you know, reigns supreme over others. And that's what's happening now. And the, the, the key, as I understand his work is, um, and, its relevance to what you're saying is the key is there must be an, an, an authentic sense of a commonwealth, an authentic sense of an understanding of oneself as necessarily in symbiotic relationship with others to move into a true state beyond the world state as it is, as, as it currently exists. And I was just wondering if you have any uh, insight or, uh, or comments in, in relation to that. Okay. Uh, yeah. Th thank you for the comment. I'll, I'll, I'll do my best just to do some comments on that before we close. One of the things you see in history is that it's leaders consciousness in particular that define the upper limits of what's possible for the next several generations to come. So whether we're looking at the American experiment in 1776, things prior to that, or for example, Roosevelt in 1945 with the, with the decision to build a world state, you know, it's the leaders who create the possibilities for, for those whom they are leading. And in integral terms, even though the lower holons establish the possibilities of the higher, and the higher establishes the, the probabilities of the lower, a true integrative commonwealth that supersedes nations will only be allowed and grown from the soil of a very healthy individual to national hierarchy that has set the possibilities for such an emergence to occur. Um, and yet, even still, it's, it's still the leader's consciousness that's most important, not the consciousness of the masses in supporting the emergence of such a thing by steering them towards something that will best serve the entire integrated spectrum of being in place at that time. So, you know, there's a little bit of a problem. Um, not a problem, but something that's a little scary about all of this, which is in all the great reorganizations of history, you know, these up-leveling reorganizations tend to occur after a humongous tragedy. Frankly, they occur after massive wars. And in each hegemonic transition, there was always a 30-year war that sat right in the middle of the transition. You know, I've been an expert in population-level behavior change and human development for a long time. And I can tell you, people don't change fast. They certainly don't change if they don't have to. People are not going to change without really being shaken up at the core enough to reimagine possibilities that by force shake them up and allow them to reimagine alternate futures. Frankly, I think a lot of that's happening right now with, with Trump in an in a, in a actually healthy way. 
So if lower level holons set the possibility to higher, it's not you know inconsistent that wars recast the bounds of what the masses consider possible or, or desirable. So it's important that a leader's consciousness tap into the soil of possibilities in, in which that kind of genuine reorganized transstatal commonwealth could occur. War is possible as a catalytic event. Uh, in fact, you know, historically, it's probably more likely than not. On the other hand, if evolution keeps pace alongside our economic needs being met, if we have enlightened leaders who gradually and incrementally take us in that uh, in that direction, then you know, maybe we can satisfy enough of it, we can relax interference to an extent. We give enlightened leaders the coverage and foundational support they need to actually negotiate and take the leading edge of our planetary governance where it could go. Okay, this is where I'll end. Thank you for participating and listening in. I, I hope it was useful. As I said, it was a short version of what is a bigger story with a lot of moving pieces. I very much appreciate you participating. Um, we'll make this recording available on Intergalife soon. And please, given that this is our first webinar of this kind, please send us your comments and feedback so we can improve. Take care and be well.